Amen. Welcome, 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 everybody out there on online community. We welcome you to another special service. We call this Blowout Sunday, and I've got a special word from the Lord as we close out a series that we've been in for the last four weeks. And so agree with us, believe with us, don't let anything distract you from outside or from within, and let's get what God has for us. You all ready today? All right. Open with me in your Bible to the book of 2 Corinthians chapter 4 as we conclude this series that we've called 10 times better. It's been based on a prophetic message from the Lord that I received about our future, about us, about those of us that watch and are online. God has prophesied and he has said that your life is about to be 10 times better than it's ever been. Corinthians chapter 4 and verse 13. Verse 13 says, And the same spirit of faith, according to what is written, I believed, and therefore I have spoken. We also believe, and therefore. I want to call this message today a spirit of faith. Something very supernatural happened. And the minister's conference is set in January. So that the heads and leaders of churches and ministries can get instruction from the Lord that affects us for that whole year. Time where we can be consecrated and set aside just hours after hours for days in the, in the presence of the Spirit of God, in the Word of God, to hear God's voice and to get His direction. And it's oftentimes that the messages that come out uh, shape us for what we end up ministering. You know, when something's poured in you, what's in you comes out of you. And something supernatural happened this year. Last week, I took the text, and we've been looking at for these three or four weeks, that God has given us a word specifically that things are going to be ten times better than they've ever been. But there's God's part and our part. He's done his part, so we've been focusing on our part. We said to you that you've got to be a nonconformist. You've got to be purpose-driven. You've got to have a spirit of excellence, and you've got to have a spirit of faith. Well, the, the head of that ministry, who's a prophet of God, absolutely a prophet of God, um, I grew up in church, and Kenneth Copeland has traveled the country, traveled the world, ministering for, I think he's like 50 years, something like that. And he gets up on the first, his minister's conference, and on the first night, he sets the tone of what the Spirit of God has given him to give to these the 1,000, 2,000 pastors and ministers, and his text was a ministry of excellence. <laughs> Super. That he used was Daniel chapter 6. And the Spirit gave to me that we used last week to minister that in order for our lives to be 10 times better, we need to have a spirit of excellence. And he ministered for two nights in a row on how to be a person or a ministry of excellence. When I was texting our executive pastoral team, I'm like, man, this is phenomenal. The second thing that was so supernatural, Brother Keith Moore, I showed you all his picture earlier, been a you know, phenomenal depositor in my life from the Holy Spirit. He gets up on the one session that he was given. He takes a text from Romans chapter 12, in verse number two, and ministers to ministers about being nonconformist. I am sitting there like, the, 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 the pastoral team, they couldn't go with me this year, I went by myself, and I'm like, no, man. I, you know, I, I, I felt like we were spot on that what God is saying is what God is saying. And what I challenge you and I to do is take a page, very close attention, this message, series, is to set the tone for your life for the next season to come. That if, in other words, if you do these things, 
focus on opportunities that show up where you can either go with the group, come on, go with the way everybody else is going, or you could choose and go God's way. Even though that's going to make you stand out and look a little different and feel kind of awkward, but go ahead and be nonconformist because God is saying, how long will you halt between two opinions? And I challenge you in these other ways to be purpose-driven, to have a spirit of excellence, to take your standard of life up another notch. Amen. So the miraculous thing about this, um, this is exactly what the Lord does. It's how Jesus operates. The Bible says in Mark chapter 16 and verse 20 that when Jesus, he gave his disciples power and authority and he went to heaven. Now, we are the body. We are Jesus in the earth. He's the head and we are the body. But how many of y'all know he's still working with us? The Bible says that they went out, the disciples, and they were preaching the word everywhere. But the Lord was doing what? Working with them and confirming what? The word that they were preaching with what? Through accompanying signs. Amen. So God confirmed this prophetic message to us by having a prophet, prophets come behind or come before and minister the same thing. And what I challenge you and I to do is know that this is a, a, from the Spirit of God and to do what God is saying to do. Amen? Now, in order for us to be 10 times better than we've ever been, we said that there's four things that we must do. And we've based this out of biblical study. There were four Hebrew boys, uh, Daniel, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, as those names that they were given, that had these same character traits. They were found to be 10 times. Why were they better than everybody else? God's no respective person. He's not going to let grace, giftings, talents, and anointings be on you and, 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 not, on, and not on somebody else. He, he, he doesn't favor you. I know you feel like God's favorite. <laughs> Any of y'all feel like your mom and dad's favorite child? We were, we were with family. and Matter of fact, we were at my dad's anniversary. And um, this was years ago. I don't know which year. My dad's been in ministry. My natural dad's been in ministry for a long, long, long time. Um, and, man, all of us got up there. We, I'm my mom and dad's favorite child. And then my sister got up, I'm my mom and dad's favorite child. And my brothers get up, I'm the favorite, actually. And then my baby brother got up, well, y'all know I'm the baby, so y'all know I'm the favorite. <laughs> Any of y'all here feel like God's favorite child? Amen. And so it is. Well, he, you know, he doesn't respect one person or the other. If you do the same things that they did, you will get the same result. So number one, we've got to be nonconformist. Number two, we've got to be purpose-driven. Number three, we've got to have a spirit of excellence. And then number four, we've got to have a spirit of faith. So I'm going to conclude today with the spirit of faith. And this is something that we all have to have in order for us to experience life ten times better in every area. But a spirit of faith also means that there will be situations that come up this year that don't look favorably in our lives. In other words, there's going to be some bad situations that happen among us and to us. Sometimes even out of our control. Things that we don't want to have happen. And what I'm challenging you is to, when that thing happens, don't be afraid and don't doubt that God has changed his mind about what he said and set for your future. Have a spirit of faith and watch God deliver you out of that situation. So we look again at 2 Corinthians chapter 4 and verse number 13. Verse 13 says, and since we have, now, I didn't take the time to read the whole chapter. I encourage you to. But he's contrasting what God did in the children of Israel in the Old Testament to what God will do in our lives in the New Testament. So Paul is writing to the church and he says, and since we have, that means you have, I have, come on, we have. Now, first thing to know about the spirit of faith is that you already got this, but you've got to let it come out. We have the same spirit of faith according to what is written, I believe, that's what he wrote in the Old Testament. There was one who had this spirit of faith. 
I believe. That means I don't know for sure, but I believe. It's not already done yet, but I believe. I can't see it. Come on, somebody. I can't see it right now, but I believe. How many of y'all know, though, it's not enough just to believe? Faith works by saying. You can believe, 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 believe all day long. I believe God's going to work it out. But if you don't say God will work it out, you can be in a place where things don't work out. Why? Because you didn't release the faith that he had. But here's the combination. When you believe out of the abundance of the heart, come on, the mouth will speak, you will say. He says, we also believe and therefore we speak. So, uh, you know, my assignment just in the, like 15 minutes or less, and I'll be done. I don't know how I'm going to do it in 15 minutes. Y'all got to give me some extra time. I want to I wanna show you what the spirit of faith looks like. I wish I could give you like a working definition, and just like I couldn't where an excellent spirit is concerned, I can where the spirit of faith is concerned. You know, we said that there's some things that are better caught than taught. And when you're talking about the spirit of faith, this is something that you got. Anybody ever caught the spirit? Well, I don't want to put you on blast. Amen. You've been in one of them churches where the preacher is preaching. Oh, and God is good. And he'll be good to you. And things get really excited when God starts working it out. And oh, I tell you, hey! Oh! I think I might have caught, you know, I got caught up there for a minute for real. But here I am, the non-dancing dancer. Somebody, somebody say, some things are better caught than taught. And in truth, this is uh, the spirit of faith. If you're going to go through your year when situations come up that look differently than what you want, you got to have a spirit of faith, and you need to know what that looks like. So I'm just simply today going to show you two examples of those that have the spirit of faith and what that looks like. I wish I could teach you and say, line on line, this is what it is, and this is the definition. Now, best thing I could do is let you know what it refers to. The spirit of faith refers to the disposition of life by which you live. In other words, there's just something about you when bad things or good things happen, there's just a disposition in you, and it's a disposition of faith. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. The Bible talks about in the book of Numbers, God brought the children of Israel out of bondage, and he had a land of promise. I mean, it had been years since he had promised that to Abram. But sure enough, when they were just supposed to go a short distance from that place to the next God told them, I want you to go into the land and spy it out. I want you to see what your future looks like. Start shopping for that new house. Start looking for that new car. Don't go to the banks to get it. I'm going to give it to you. I mean, if you read the book of Deuteronomy, and, and, and number, you, when you look at the detail of what God said, he said, I've got a land for you, and in that land there are houses that you didn't build, there are orchards, there are lands that I am just, I am gifting to you. You're not going to have to do this at the sweat of your own brow. Well, sure enough, uh, the children of Israel are supposed to go right over. This is Numbers 13. Numbers is a long book. And God told them in verse number 1 and 2, the Lord said, who said? The Lord said to Moses, I want you to send men to spy out the land of Canaan, which I am giving to the children of Israel. From each tribe of their fathers, there's 12 tribes of Israel, send a man, everyone a leader among them, somebody that can be respected from each family group. So if he come back, well, I don't know that other guy, but I know that guy. He said in verse uh, 30, though. So sure enough, I don't, again, I don't have time to go through every verse, but you should read it. So, man, they picked out these 12 guys, Joshua and Caleb. They were amongst the 12. And then there was 10 other guys, each from a different tribe. They go out. And for 40 days, they walk through the land. They're getting there, and they're looking around. They're making notes, surveying the land. Man, they come one day, and they see, gosh, you see that guy? He's like 10 feet, 9 foot, 6 at least. That's a giant. Matter of fact, I saw him. He went over there, and there was a big woman there. I mean, come on, somebody. <laughs> Well, they were the children of the giants. 
She was like at least eight foot seven. And then, man, did you see this fruit? Man, they cut down some of the fruit. And, and two, <laughs> two guys carrying a cluster of grapes on a pole between the two of them. They gathered all this. They saw one city. Y'all do know that Jericho was in the land of promise. Man, look how massive this city is. This city, I mean, all the way, we walked all the way around the wall. And there's no way you can get into this. They did that for 40 days. And they came back, and they're supposed to bring a report. Now, God's not surprised about what's in your future. Oh, I'm preaching better than we got time to have. He's not surprised how big the giants are in your future. He's not surprised at how good it is in your future. And he's not surprised at how tough it is in your future. But this happened. So these 12 guys, they get back. Oh, here they come. We see the caravan coming in. Hey, all the people of Israel, like 3 million people out there in the wilderness waiting to go to their home, their future home, right? So all of the men, they, they quiet the people. And all of them stand up. I don't know if they had a spokesperson. Sounds like they did. If, if you read the chapter, you can figure it out yourself. And so maybe they got 12 guys standing in front of 3 million people, and, and they're, they're starting to speak, and they say, all right, people, we are going now to tell you what it was like. This is some of the fruit. And people are like, I ain't never seen grapes like that. The land flows with milk and honey. I mean, just running over. Honey running out of the honeycomb. Milk everywhere, okay. Land that flows with milk and honey. But there's some walled cities in that land. I mean, fortified cities. And then one day we saw Maybe another person spoke up. And there, there was this, there was nine foot giants in that land. And then even the regular sized people, man, them guys were like dudes. <laughs> and think about the mass of people. Again, when you read your chapter, go there and imagine yourself being in the congregation. All of a sudden, people are like, what? Oh, giants? Oh, wall cities? Oh, and... Caleb is hearing, he's seeing the people reacting, and he's like, dude, come on, man. That's the, just tell them the basics. <laughs> Don't tell them it costs $5 million. <sighs> oh. And the people started to be discouraged by the report. What you'd imagine, you believe in God for something, and then the doctor come in and give you some negative report. I'm showing you Joshua and Caleb because they have an excellent spirit. The Bible says in Numbers 30, 13, verse 30, that then Caleb, right while they were, the people were getting upset, he says, oh, hold on, people, before Moses. He said, let us go up at once and take possession, for we are well able to overcome it. What was that? I believe, therefore I speak. He had differently than the other 10 a spirit of faith about him. When it looked impossible to everybody else, to him was like, well, we, we can do it today. Matter of fact, we don't even got a, oh, 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 come on, somebody. He said, let us go up at once. Come on, pastor, you know, let's get a realtor. Let's look for the land. What you got? Come on, let's do this. We ain't got to wait. But sure enough, man, but the men who had gone up with him. They cut him off. Be quiet, Caleb. We are not able to go. It's not like what you think. Don't believe that guy. The majority rules, right? A nonconformist doesn't go with the crowd. We are not able to go. We saw giants there. They're repeating it. Descendants of Anak came from the giants, and we were like grasshoppers. Notice in our own sight. And so we were in their sight. Notice, because they didn't see themselves, it caused how other people saw them. Man, by the time they finished chapter 14, verse 1, all the congregation, every single one of them, lifted up their voice and they cried. And the people wept that night. They are in an uncomfortable place to start with. They're in a wilderness. And there's times that we go through wilderness seasons in our lives. And we have a hope for the future. But what if you found out in your future there's some tough situations? You know, oh, man. There's no way we could do that. 
they started talking about going back to Egypt. They were like, maybe we can go back to Barker Cypress. I said, can we go back to Barker Cypress? And then Joshua and Caleb, they were like, we're not going back to Barker Cypress. The Bible says that they tore their clothes. In verse 6, the people started talking about going back, and Joshua was like, oh, wait, wait, we're not going back to that little building. Who were, the, who were among them? They tore their clothes, they, and then they started talking to them. How many of y'all know it's the spirit of faith that will do something? They were like, I'm serious. I'm not going back. And they were trying to encourage the people, and the people, right after this, you'll read it in your own time, they spake of stoning Joshua and Caleb. And the moment that they said, you know what, let's stone them, because they keep interrupting us while we're trying to discourage you. So let's just kill them out, right? And then we can continue thinking about how we're going to get back to Egypt. Maybe Pharaoh, would, I know we killed half his army or all of his army. And, you know, maybe he'll take us back, right? And so they spake a stolen. And the moment they spake a stolen, the Spirit of God showed up. And God said from there on, all the way down to where we're about to, he says, you know what? Move out of the way, Moses. I'm going to kill all of these people right now, and I'm going to start over with you. You know he already did that before, right? That's what he did with Noah. He's like, you know what? You know what? These folks are evil, and they're going to always be evil. Come here, Noah. I'm going to use you. And God literally said it, and Moses was like, oh, God, don't do that. Other nations will hear what kind of God you are, and that won't look bad for you, right? So he was like, no, no, be merciful, God. And God was merciful, but listen, he says, you know what? I'm going to be merciful, but all of these men and all of this generation that cried just because they saw a tough time coming, I'm preaching good today. These people that fell out and cried and had a difficult time just because one banker said, no, come on, you ain't even supposed to be going that way in the first place. He said, they won't go into the land. That's how they ended up wandering for 40 years. He said, I'll take your children. There you see. I'll keep my promise. I'll take your seed into the land, but you won't go. The Bible says that day that the men whom, whom Moses sent to spy out the land, who returned and made all the congregation complain, those 10 guys against him that day by bringing a what? Bad report of the land. Verse 37 says those very men who brought the evil report about the land died by the plague before the Lord. In other words, those 10 guys, they died that day. And then all the rest of the congregation lived out their days in the wilderness. But everybody who was 20 years old at that time and under, with the exception of Joshua and Caleb. See, a spirit of faith, when the majority goes one way, you, you end, the spirit of faith will take you the other way. Because you were nonconformist, you'll end up just like Joshua and Caleb. The, ver the Bible says in verse 38, but Joshua and Caleb, the son of Joshua, they remained alive of the, men that, of the men that were sent. Why did God allow them to go into the promised land? It's verse 24. This is your key, and then we'll go on to the second example. Verse 24. Oh, man, I hit the wrong button. My, but my servant Caleb, because he has a different spirit in him, and has followed me fully, I will bring him and Joshua into the land where he went and his descendants shall inherit it. Why? He had a different spirit about him. There was something different about him. When he got a bad report, when he got a negative, he saw it, he saw the glass half full. <laughs> so if you're a pessimist, that's for the past. Train yourself to be optimist. You can't look at life anymore as it being half empty. You need to see life as it being full and overflowing. Amen. And when situations of difficulty come in your life this year, look at it through the eyes of faith, not through fear. You get a negative report from the doctor, you say, thank you so, thank you so much. And you go home and you praise and you rejoice and you thank God I will live and not die and I will declare. You put you on some praise music. Come on. That's what a spirit of faith does when a negative report comes. I can tell you this also about the spirit of faith. The spirit of faith understands faith. 
It understands the why of faith. And if you miss this series, go back and study it and understand it in a way that you can. Why? Because the spirit of faith understands faith. There's four reasons I taught you, and you got to know that you know these. Number one, it understands that this is the way God operates. It understands that God requires us to live, us, live a life by faith. It understands that, that with, without faith, we cannot please God. And it understands that it accesses grace by faith. Know that when you live life by faith. It understands, number two, what faith is. It understands that faith is, is a firm persuasion. It's not proof. Stop looking for proof. You're looking at your husband like, you know, God, show me a sign that he's going to change and be a better man. No, don't look at, you know, God, t you know, just, just do one thing for me. Help her to talk to me better. That'll be a sign that better will come. No, it can look like it's going worse. It can look like it's getting worse. And a person with a spirit of faith, knowing that it's a persuasion, it's not proof. And if it's not firm, it's not faith. Number three, know how faith comes. If you feel like I need more faith, then how do you get it? I can tell you, faith comes by hearing an anointed message from God. That's why you can't afford to be a second and fourth Sunday Christian. I mean, I don't even sound right. You need to go to church as much as humanly possible. Because every time God speaks at Faith Family, God speaks. Anytime we have a service, there's a word from God. And if you can't come, there's no excuse. You can go online and get it. You can go on Facebook and get it. Right? It understands that faith comes by experiencing God in a, in a supernatural way if, and accepting it a truth. That's how you get faith. And then lastly, uh, the spirit of faith understands how faith works. Faith works by speaking. Faith works by doing. Faith works by patience. And faith works by love. You've got to know that. Amen. But the last example, as I conclude, is the example of the Hebrew boys that were put in the burning, fiery furnace. We started off this series looking at them because they were ten times better than everybody else. And God prophesied and said, you're going to be ten times better this year than you've ever been. What's going to make the difference? You're a nonconformist. You're purpose-driven. You had an excellent spirit. But I want to show you today that these boys had a spirit of faith. Y'all know the story of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego? It's phenomenal. When you read it this week, read it slowly. Imagine. Who through faith they subdued promises they did what stopped the mouths of lions Dan Daniel in the lion's den he stopped those lions mouth by faith how did he do that when they lowered him down into that den of lions he had a spirit of faith like hey I did what God told me to do I pray I do my part God's got me he said God has delivered me amen the next verse says that by faith they quenched the violence of fire they did that by faith. That refers specifically to Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. So if you'll go there in the book of Daniel, chapter 3, as you read it this week, you'll find out that the king at that time, Nebuchadnezzar, he made an image of gold whose height was 60 cubits. Let's just say 60 feet. And its width was 6 cubits. Let's say 6 feet. So you got something that's 60 feet tall, but only 6 feet wide. It's very tall. And he says, I want, and he set up it in a plain of Dura. And he says, now, I want everybody to bow down. This is my God. I made it. It's an image. And I want everybody to bow down and worship my God. He's the king. He can do that. But God told his children, you don't worship any other God before. Me. You don't bow down to any other God. You will have no other God beside me. But now you got a choice. The world says you could do this, but God says you can't do that. And your body wants to do this. But God says, don't do that. Now you got a choice. How long will you halt between two opinions? But because they had something in them, they were nonconformists. When they played the music and the harps and the psaltery, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, they stood up while everybody else was prostrate on the ground. Sure enough, some people saw them being nonconformists and they couldn't stand them because of it. They went back and they told King Nebuchadnezzar, there's some of the certain province that did not bow to you. They brought him up on charges unapologetically, they stood before the king. And the Bible tells us in verse 14, when Nebuchadnezzar heard that they hadn't bowed, he called them, he said to them saying, 
Is it true? Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, that you do not serve my gods and worship the gold image which I set up? Now, if you are ready, because I didn't see you, they said you didn't bow. So, get let the musicians, come, come back up here, musicians. Now, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, if you are ready, at the moment you hear the sound of the horn, the flute, and the harp, and the fire, and the salt tree, and the symphony, with all kinds of music, and you fall down and worship the image which I made, then we good. But if when you hear the music, you do not worship, let me tell you what I'm going to do. The devil will bark. You know, he's a roaring lion. He's as a roaring lion. Let me correct myself. He's as a roaring lion. You know why the Bible says that the devil is as a roaring lion? Because he's not. He's been defanged. He's been detoothed. Jesus knocked his teeth out. But he still got his bark. He can prowl around and, and if he can get you to be afraid, you'll end up using faith in reverse. And it's not that he has power to do it. You use your own power. Job said, my own fears have come upon me. In other words, you brought it on yourself because you did it in fear and not in faith. He has no authority. He said, but if you do not worship, you shall be, this is the threat, cast immediately into the midst of a burning fiery furnace and who is the God who would deliver you from my hands? I love this because this is the answer. This is the spirit of faith. I believe, therefore I speak. Listen to what they said. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego answered and said, said to the king, Oh, Nebuchadnezzar, we have no need to answer you in this matter. What are you talking about? He asked them a question. He said, we don't need to answer you. If, it, if that is the case that you have them play that music, and, you, and we don't bow, and you throw us into the fiery furnace, if that is the case, then our God we serve is able to deliver us from the burning fiery furnace, and he will. Oh, man, I wish I had some time. He what? He will. Remember, he said we are more able to overcome them. Let's go up now. That's the spirit of faith. He says, our God whom we serve, he is able, and he will deliver us from your hand, O king. But if you don't play the music, let it be known unto you, O king, that we don't serve your gods, nor will we worship the gold image which you have set up. Please understand this. They weren't saying if God don't deliver us, we want you to know that we're not going to serve. No, 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 no. He's, what Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego said was if you play the music, we're not going to bow and you throw us in, God's going to get us out. But if you decide because we're not going to bow that you're not going to play the music. In other words, if you change your mind and throwing us in because you don't want to see God embarrass you like that in front of all your people, then we just want you to know we're not going to bow. Somebody say, but if not. Man, this made that guy so angry that the face, his face changed. And in the verse 23, the Bible says, oh, no, there we go, but if not, okay, I have to quote that part. <laughs> so King Nebuchadnezzar, they said that to him, he got so angry that his face contorted, and he told him, heat up the fiery furnace seven times hotter than it should. Anybody ever made a bonfire? We used to live on two acres of land, and so I would have to burn the sticks that fall in the, in, in the grass. And, and, you know, we would put that in. And sometimes the flames of the fire would get so hot, I can't even get any closer. I can't even get close enough to throw it in. It's just so hot. It was so hot, the Bible says, that they wrapped up Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. Big got some real big, strong guys, carried them up to the front of that furnace, and threw them into the middle of the furnace. And because the fire was so hot, they, the big guys didn't make it back. They died right there at the door. But not Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. The Bible says in verse 23 that these three men, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, they fell down bound into the midst of the burning fiery furnace. And then, then King, King Nebuchadnezzar, who was astonished, he arose in haste and he spoke saying to his counselors, wait, 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 wait. Didn't we throw three men bound into the midst of the fire? They were like, yes, O king. He said, well, how is it? Look, I answer, I see four men in the fire and they're walking around and they don't look hurt. And the form of the first is like the son of God. Woo -hoo -hoo -hoo. Those boys, hey, 
No weapon formed against you might prosper, shall prosper. The weapon might form, but it won't prosper. They were right in the middle of it and they were walking around. And guess what? Because they did it with a spirit of faith, Jesus showed up right there in the midst of it. Come on, why? Because faith works by love and love will never leave you in a bad situation. Jesus himself will be with you through the toughest times and toughest situations in your life. I just got to close and I close with this last verse. In verse 28, Nebuchadnezzar, he spake and he said, Blessed be God of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, who sent his angel and delivered his servants who trusted in him. And they have frustrated the king's word. They yielded their bodies that they should not serve or worship any other God. He made all the other people worship God of Shadrach, and Meshach, and Abednego. Will you stand up with me on your feet? You got to have a spirit of faith. You just do. Bad reports are going to come. But you don't have to believe the bad report. God's got a good report already. He's written it in his word. Have a spirit of faith. As you go throughout this year, I'm going to teach you more. It's coming, but it's called the opposite. Do it. And in your actions. And you will see the dreams that God has for your life come to pass. Amen? Amen. Let me pray for you and then I'm going to dismiss. Father.